I, I said to myself, this is, this is the worst call that I'm ever going to go on. This is, this is the, the, the worst thing that I'm ever going to see. I hope they're not dead. <sighs> dead. If anything, I hope they're still alive. The next thing that I recall was um, seeing the ground coming at me and uh, you know, thinking that, knowing that I was going to die. Yeah, so when we got the tones for the call, uh, we had been listening because it had become a fairly large structure fire in a neighboring district and it is a rural fire as well. So um, we were anticipating that there was a need because there aren't a lot of water tenders in, um, in the area. So we anticipated that there might, we may be going. Uh, we were standing down here in the bay and with that anticipation and um, it was a it's a long ways away so we we recognized that it was a long ways away it was all the way on the other side of the county from us um, from the east side all the way to the west side so when we loaded into the tender um, and we left the station um, we had known that they had gone defensive on the house uh, it was a it sounded like a large home and fully involved so we um, we had been listening pretty closely to that and then uh, when we left here, we got when we got on the road. I actually had told Connor, um, you know, this is the most dangerous vehicle that we own, and um, it's the f slowest to speed up and the slowest to slow down. And we, I had told him that just a mile from the station. Took what had come in and was dispatched as a heavily involved fire, fully involved fire with explosions and and you know really a, a tremendous body of fire and they knocked it out pretty quick. So by the time I made it that far south, most of the smoke was pretty lazy. It was, you know, post-control smoke. We got concerned that we were not going the right way because this is such a large fire um, and there's so many resources on it that we hadn't seen any smoke. We couldn't see a smoke plume and it's a crystal clear blue sky day. Um, and, um, I, the descent down Wolfensburger toward 105 is a fairly um, steep hill. I've, I've heard seven or eight percent grade. I, I remember bits and pieces of the descent. Um, and I remember feeling like I was having trouble um, controlling the descent for a, a portion of the hill. And then um, the, one of the clearest th two things that I remember uh, the first was we came around a blind corner and there's the T in the road um, at where Wolfensburger meets Jackson 105 um, uh, or Highway 105 and, and that was my heart sank. Um, I knew we were not going to stop th at that moment and I prefaced that to Connor. I said we're in trouble. This is, we're in big trouble and um, I the next thing that I recall was um, seeing the ground coming at me and uh, you know, thinking that, knowing that I was going to die. Metcom, Bureau 3 with emergency traffic on 2. Bureau 3, go ahead. I'm on scene of a fire apparatus rollover. My location on the NDT, and that's it. Exactly sure my location at this point. Bureau 3, I copy, I got you on scene. Looks like Highway 105 in Wolfensburger for a fire apparatus roller. We'll start cruise that way. If you can confirm on injuries. Next on Bureau 3. Bureau 3, go. I have injuries and entrapment. Command. Heavy extrication. Injuries and entrapment. Heavy extrication. Um, myself and Chief Willis at the time. Um, I mentioned to him, I said, that's got to be ours. So we both got up and uh, left the board meeting and started to proceed over to uh, 105 and Wolfensburger Road. I hope they're not dead. Dead. If anything, I hope they're still alive. Well, in a moment of total transparency, I, I had a thought and I, th I, I said to myself, this is, 
this is the worst call that I'm ever going to go on. This is, this is the, the, the worst thing that I'm ever going to see, uh, especially given the radio traffic that, you know, there was one, one uh, firefighter that was unconscious and unresponsive. And uh, based on the, like you said, a very violent looking scene, you know, clearly, um, you know, it's, it's a tender that just landed on the deck of an aircraft carrier, right? It, it went from, you know, from whatever mile an hour to zero in, in a matter of, you know, 20 yards, 30 yards. So it was, it was a pretty big impact. I um, mean, just, you, you see, you know, as I, as I come up, all I remember is just a darkness uh, around. It was starting to get to be sunset and uh, just with the lights and the illumination of the, the truck that's flipped over on its side, um, the rescuers that are, are, are standing out there, um, you know, the radio traffic said it's still stating that they're reporting too critical pinned in the truck. I just went up and kind of stood next to Josh, who was, who was the one that was kind of pinned at the top of the truck and held his hand. Because um, it was taken, it was complicated by um, being a heavier truck and trying to get everybody out um, and just figure that um, having somebody there that they knew talking to them um, was, was gonna help at that point in time. Uh, trying to, to absolutely stand out of the way of of everything going on, but you know, being next to them and making sure that you know, and reassuring them that we're going to contact his wife and all those kind of things that somebody knows. A white helmet had come over top of us and was talking to me and maybe holding my hand. Um, I remember being completely trapped in the vehicle and I had been trying to fight it, but. Um, and I, I couldn't tell if I was bleeding badly or if it was water from the tender that was falling on me um, uh, and running off of me, but I, um, I, I just don't remember a lot of the incident. I, I do recall at one point that Chief Woodrick had arrived and, um, and climbed in and, um, and was talking to me briefly during the extrication. We all want to do the exact same thing at this call. We all want to be at the end of a cutter or a spreader and, and be there to cut our brothers out. Um, but someone has to land a chopper. Someone has to pull a, 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 you know, a safety line off of the engine. Uh, all of those other, th the, those other pieces are as important as operating the cutters and spreaders. And that restraint is, is vital. And, and it's one of the things that I think uh, to a person, we did a great job with this. Everyone, you know, really maintained control of their emotions and 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 did their job, and they they stayed within their lane. Uh, we still have uh, all of Frank Town's crews back at Station One, uh, Josh's shift. Uh, that they were aware of the accident right now. That have no idea what's going on, the severity, um, trying to make sure that we could come back and make sure that they're capable to continue to respond and be ready. Um, getting somebody headed to um, pick up his wife, um, alert Connor's mom of an accident and notifying family. State Patrol determined that the, the posted speed limit at, at that area was 45 miles an hour. Our vehicle was traveling 39 at the top of the hill when he started down. Josh has probably over 300 hours of driver operator training, 50 involving uh, either a tender or an engine that is involved with air brake systems. So it's not from a lack of experience. Could we still continue to do better? Absolutely, but we were doing everything that NFPA, the state of Colorado, uh, they, they go through the testing, the, the, the courses, the road courses, to uh, EVOC uh, trainings to make sure that we were doing that. So, you know, we thought that we were doing everything we could. The State Patrol kind of started to narrow it down to a few things. Um, driver unfamiliarity with the area. Um, this was a call that was responding over into West Douglas. Um, which is like two fire districts over. Um, so the familiarity with the roads that are over there um, complicates our drivers, you know, they're not sure of them. Um, this, this road also has a very steep incline down to a, a stop sign in a, a T-section or dead-end road that comes on it very quickly. Um, in fact, the uh, homeowner that where the accident occurred in his driveway had had multiple accidents in this field 
over the past years, one including a school bus. So uh, with not a lot of road markings of the steep incline that's coming down. Um, and then the, the, uh, probably one of the bigger factors were out of the six brakes uh, adjustments on the trucks, three of them were out of adjustment. The average vehicle on the road is 3,000 pounds, and this is 75,000 pounds. It's 25 times heavier than your average vehicle. There's 3,300 gallons of water in the back. You know, that, that's 25,000 pounds just in water weight. And there's baffling in there, and it sloshes still, and it, you feel this way. And they explained that it's important to... Uh, if you, if you start to feel unstable, that you just slow down. Um, because if we don't get there, then what good are we? And I learned that the hardest way. This tender actually gets a daily check uh, from the on-duty personnel at our volunteer stations. Uh, it's, it's at least a monthly check that all of them go through. Uh, following uh, what NFPA kind of outlines, um, we pulled the, the vehicle maintenance records in 2012, uh, it went into and, and had the brake system completely gone through, uh, repaired, inspected, maintained by a third party shop. Um, we calculated an average that we only put 750 miles on these trucks a year. So from 2012 till the accident, the brake system only had 4,500 miles on it. Some of the standards, NFPA recommends per manufacturer's standards of frequency of checks. Um, when you, we start to look at what Freightliner puts out, uh, they start to reference what the brake system portions is. And so you have Bindex or additional brake systems that seem to have multiple different standards across the board. There was just said it seemed to be a lot of confusion with no hard, fast rules of annually biannually or anything based on mileage. Back the month before the accident, the vehicle had just received all new tires, alignments, and things like this. So we, we kind of thought that we were doing what was right and, and what the best we could, and we found out that we really missed the mark on the visual inspection portion that could have possibly helped prevent a portion of this. In the recent events of the, the accident, uh, we've gone through and NFPA used to outline a, a visual inspection. Um, and I've been in the fire service for 27 years and, and spent five years as, as a driver operator uh, with a department that has extensive training but was never very good on what a visual inspection is. Um, and so we've adopted the, the DOT um, and we actually had a, a fire mechanic come in and give all our personnel a class on what a vehicle inspection entails. Um, and it's about a 10 to 15 minute weekly check um, that we go thoroughly through the system, um, that they're underneath the vehicle visually checking the slack adjusters, the drums, and everything like this to, to ensure that everything is operational within limits. Um, it, it gives these guys a, a better, stronger knowledge of braking systems with, within this, um, and it's, it's definitely made it a safer aspect. It's probably, it doesn't necessarily going to prevent every accident, but it's going to make sure that the truck is equipped and be ready to stop as, as quickly as it can. We, we didn't know what we didn't know, and we've learned, and so um, I certainly don't want anyone to ever have to deal with this again. Learn from us that uh, it's something you don't want to go through, that you, you, you don't want to have to respond on anything like that. Um, in talking to other uh, chiefs and departments afterwards, it was, you know, we found out that one of our neighboring departments um, actually had a similar incident that their water truck had run off the end of the road. Um, and they had actually had instigated this uh, aspect of a more thorough brake check. Um, but, um, and, and within their own departments, they're doing great. But if, unless we make other departments known about it, um, you know, we're not doing our job of passing on these types of things to prevent the accidents. Um, and to try to give your, your crews that are responding out there every uh, opportunity to be successful and, and arrive on scene of a, of a call to, to do their jobs. I think about the impact that it had on the people that were there, um, 
because it hits so close to home for a lot of the guys that we work with. This call affected me in a, in a big way. It, it was uh, when I drove away from this call, I was convinced this was the last call I was going on. You got to take care of yourself. And peer support, EAP, uh, clinical psychologists, uh, there's, there's so many resources out there. Uh, don't put on this big wall and say, I can handle it all, because I've handled it all for 30 some years. Um, you you got to make sure that you really are uh, emptying that bucket of, of trauma and, and stuff that we see over the years. So the rig off, I'm going to undo the parking brake, put my foot on the brake and release all of the air in the system. With that, I check to make sure that once I hit below 30, my parking brakes um, pop out and automatically apply. So now that I don't have any air in the system, I'm gonna turn on the rig, check the timing to see that it builds pressure in the appropriate amount of time. And then with this rig, I'm checking to see that the uh, alarms are going off at the appropriate time at 30 PSI and then at 60 PSI. So next time I'm gonna inspect all of the brake drums themselves, the slack adjusters to make sure that there's no orange showing or red showing, make sure that they're kind of all at the same depth in the front and then the back will be at a separate depth. Um, then looking at the brake lines and then the actual brakes themselves. Also looking at the discs to make sure there's even wear and not a ton of wear and not a bunch of rusting. Okay. With uh, this rig specifically, we also have to check the air filter, um, make sure that it's still intact and then make sure there's not a bunch of oil and debris bleeding out from it. Oil bleeding out of it means that there is oil in the system itself. So once back here, I go through and check my tanks, make sure the lines running into the air supply tanks are good. Um, push on them, bleed off any air or oil that might be in the system. Um, and then I will move up to the two tanks further down the rig. Bleed a little bit of air and any moisture that is inside the tanks. All the moisture, oil, everything's bled out of those tanks. I'll move back and inspect the drums and slack adjusters for the rear, making sure that they're both engaged to make sure there's no holes in them. You want both sides to be at the same. Um, if they're not, it shows uneven braking, which could be damage to the drums or the brakes themselves. Again, checking the brake pads and the hubs. And while I'm down here, also checking the leaf springs. Again, uh, checking drums, slack adjusters, hoses, also checking airbags because they do have airflow going to them. If they are causing a leak, it can cause a leak on the whole system. Here is your uh, slack adjusters. Um, once they are overextended, they're further down there is an orange ring around them. So if the orange rings around the slack adjusters are showing, they need to be repaired or replaced. 